Amen. Yeah, Show some love to these guys as they have a seat. It's good to see you, dude. You can sit too. Just keep clapping though. Don't stop. Don't stop. My name is Josh Trueblood, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship. And um, moments like that are just uh, it, just really huge for us. Uh, we're so thankful for the way that the message of Christ is going out, not just in these four walls. Amen. 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 Um, we've got a special treat for you today in this message. We're starting a new series today. It's going to be two weeks, and we've got four, Christians call them testimonies. It's people telling their story. And I'm going to show two of them to you today, and um, really life-changing stuff. And I hope you connect uh, with what's going on. Um, but the concept overall is that God rewrites our story. Every single one of us has a story. Yes? Amen. And God wants to come in and he wants to rewrite your story. And you're going to see that in these two testimonies is that they had a story before and God came in and he rewrote it. So um, I want to start with um, the movie, The Sixth Sense, which I know is weird to talk about in church, but we're just going to talk about it. The Sixth Sense. Did you see The Sixth Sense? Okay. If you didn't, then it's too late for you because I'm going to spoil the end. Bruce Willis was dead all along. Sorry. There you go. The movie came out 23 years ago. If you've not seen it yet, you've missed your chance. He was dead all along. Here's the idea. You're watching this story, and you think you know all the way through what has gone on. And then you get to that twist ending, to that surprise ending. But it didn't just surprise you. It didn't just twist. It rewrote the whole movie. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you would watch the whole movie believing that Bruce Willis' character was actually alive. And once you realize that he had been a ghost all along, man, this is weird to talk about in church. But once you realized, it became a completely different movie, and I would argue even a better movie. Sometimes we look at our entire lives and the way that it has unfolded, and we think we know what it's been all about, and then God comes in. And God doesn't just give you a twist ending when you get saved. He rewrites your whole story. He helps you understand from the very beginning what he had been doing all along. Do you see it now? Amen. Amen. We've got the very first slide, very first scripture. Can we have that? Psalm 139, 16. You saw me before I was born. Take that in. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, God says. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God said he wrote down all the days of your life and he wrote down all the moments in your life before you had lived a single one of them. Quick question, whose book is it? It's his book. It's not your book. Say, it's not my book. It's not my book. It's his book. And so who's the author? He's the author. Say, he's the author. I'm not the author. I'm not the author of my own story. We think we are. We think we're the one who lives. We're the one who chooses. We're the one who sets our own course. But according to that verse, you are not the author of your own story. And once you understand that, you understand how he has the right to come in and rewrite some moments, rewrite some chapters. Amen? So we've got two stories today that we're going to show you guys. The very first one is Molly. We're going to look at Molly's story first. Um, Molly's story, I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize it this way. Molly's a church kid. Molly grew up in the church. Some of you guys were church kids. You grew up in the church. You went to Sunday school. Where's my Sunday school kids at? Anybody? Yes? Yes? All right, if, if you grew up in the church, if you're a church kid, you need to listen to what Molly has to say to you extra close. Because she's got revelation that's just for us. Because what she did is she started, and you're going to see it, and just listen close to what she says. You're going to see that she went through her life thinking that it was up to her, that she had to live a certain kind of life with the Lord. She thought that she had to be extra close to God. See, when you grow up in the church, and see if you can relate to this, you hear all these lessons, 
And somebody might explain the gospel of God's grace to you, that you don't have to earn your own salvation, that you don't have to earn anything, but that it is amazing grace through faith that Jesus did it all for us. Amen? You're going to learn that. But even though you learn that, going to Sunday school, growing up in the church, you also learn a whole lot of other lessons that are all about walking the path of Jesus. And walking the way that Jesus would walk and doing the things that Jesus would do and letting him kind of control your life, direct you. And you learn so much stuff about how your behavior ought to go if you're walking in the path of Jesus. This little lie starts to creep into every single church kid. It's all of us. That it's my behavior that makes my faith. It's my behavior and my moral success that makes God okay with me that even makes God love me. And maybe it's all that that makes me go to heaven or not. And no one says that to us, but it seeps in. We just feel it. Did anybody grow up feeling that? I think a lot of us did. So Molly's going to tell us that God rewrote that for her. So let's go ahead and roll Molly's story. My life before um, Christ was... I, <clears throat> there was a period, like a long 10 period, 10 year period that um, he wasn't at the forefront of my mind. I grew up in church and I was like, <clears throat> I was very involved in like the kids ministries on Wednesday. Um, I was very involved in the youth group. Um, there was a point in my life when I was like, I remember 14, I was at camp and um, we were like up at the cross one night at camp and I remember God like audibly talking to me and saying like, Molly, lead my people. Um, There were things that like happened with the church and then it just like all fell apart. Um, And I left the church altogether and I was, it was kind of like an anger thing. Like I was mad at um, the church and then it was just like, I fell into this like spot of like, what the world was wanting me to do. So it was like, I was making my own decisions. I was partying on the weekends. I was doing whatever um, I wanted to do instead of like calling on God and asking him what he wanted me to do. So my grandmother passed away in 2016. Um, At this time, I was still very much, um, I would say like surface level Christian at this point. Like we would go to church sometimes, but it wasn't like um, a huge deal if we didn't. Um, and when my grandmother passed away, I was like devastated. And the only person to blame at that point was God. Um, I was mad at him. I just like didn't want anything to do with him at that point. Um, how could he take away my favorite person in the whole world? Um, and so there was a moment after that, it was like a little after a year after she passed away. And I remember sitting in my car and I was listening to the radio and Oceans came on and it was not a Christian station, so it was just like random. Um, And I remember listening to the words of that song and it literally just pouring, I felt like Holy Spirit like pouring into my heart at that moment. Um, It was like God was reaching his hand out and saying like, Molly, I'm here, I've been here, I'm with you. Um, I was just like a wreck Um, and you know, feeling that inner peace because I feel like before it's so hard because you are just like chasing after something like you're filling this hole that in your life like God wants God gives you the peace in your life but before that it was like I was always like running after what's next like oh I need to get married I need to have kids I need to do this and that I need to get a job Um, and it was never really like I had an inner peace of like everything is going to be okay. Um, At that moment when the song came on and I just like felt the Holy Spirit, um, it was like I could feel the inner peace inside of me um, and it changed me from then on. My life since encountering um, Christ in that in that moment has not been I don't want to say not been easy, but I feel like there's a misconception because people think like, oh, you're a Christian, your life should be great, and your life is amazing. And so I feel like the past several years, I've had to relearn um, who Jesus is and what he is like, what his love means. Um, Experiencing different religions at a young age, you get all of this back knowledge of like who they think, like 
what you should do as far as like, for God to love you, you have to read your Bible, you have to pray every day, you have to serve and do all of these things and not just that he loves me for who I am. And so I've spent the last several years like learning who I am and who's God, who God says I am. Um, and just like the love of Jesus, you know, like, and then pouring that out onto people um, and serving people just because you like want to show people who Jesus is. Um, that wasn't something that was shown to me when I was little. And so like, that's been a huge thing for me. Um, just like, I want people to know who Jesus is. I want them to have that encounter. Um, and so I'm just, it's still a struggle. You know, you still have to, um, live your life every day and wake up and make the choice to follow God and like continue this relationship with him um, and make it a priority and that's just what I've been trying to do. Yeah, you could applaud that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, there's so much that, that some of you might be connecting to in Molly's story um, and I don't want to take away from any of that detail. Um, let me just pull out one big thing um, I want to talk about out of that story is that she kind of went down through and she, she gave you a sense, gave us all a sense of, um, hey, she'd kind of been in the church and she kind of walked away from the church, kind of got mad at the church. And her grandma had died and she kind of got mad at God for that. And all these things kind of broke her and God. Do you see that? And then it was like, well, what about my Bible reading? What about prayer? And what about all the things that I'm not doing? I'm, and I'm not serving, and I'm not doing any of those things to, to live for God. And, and if all that's wrong, how do I fix it? She didn't fix it. Did you notice she didn't fix it? She didn't fix it. She said, he just loves me for me. Oh, man, that's a testimony, isn't it? He just loves me for me. God just came after her and rescued her that day. And I absolutely love that. And he rewrote the story because a lot of times we think that we've got to go, and we've got to clean ourselves up to come to God. And he just loves us. He just loved her. And he'll just, by the way, love you. Amen. He'll just love you. And, and you might not believe it today. So I'm going to take you to the Bible and I'm going to prove it to you. Can I do that? Can we have a little bit of time in God's word? Because I think you need to see this so that you know that what we're talking about today isn't just people's opinion about how to find God. We're going to talk right at the beginning about how broken we are, how bad it is, and how good God is. Amen. Okay, we're going to do the bad news for the good news. First, sin breaks our relationship with God. This is Isaiah 59, 2, right on your screens. It is your sins that have cut you off from God because of your sins he is turned away and will not listen anymore. Our sin cut us off from God. What sin? Sin's this big concept in Christianity. Sin is all the things that we do in our selfishness for ourselves. In our self-reliance, we sin. And we do things that hurt us, hurt other people, grieve the Lord. It's the things like our pride it's the things like our selfishness. It's the things like our out-of-control anger and the things that we do in our out-of-control anger. It's our addictions. It's our lusts. It's on and on and on. Our violence. It's on and on and on. All the things that we do, all the darkness that we pour into the world. It says, the scripture says there, that it cuts us off from a relationship with God. Do you know why? It's not because God is mean and God's some kind of an ogre and God's super touchy with a clipboard with you. That's not the idea. The idea is that God, if you want to think about it geographically, spiritually, he's, he's good and he's right here and he's good and he's holy and he's kind and he's merciful. And when you do all the things that are not holy and good and kind and merciful, like God, you're walking away from him. Sin is us saying, no, I'll do it my own way. I've got, I, 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 I'm going to do it like this over here. Walk my own path. And so it cuts us off. And we don't intend it to, but it cuts us off from relationship with God. It's us walking away. Next thing that you need to know is that we can't save ourselves from that broken relationship. Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a path before each person that seems right, 
but it ends in death. And I don't think I've got a slide for that one. There's a way that seems right to every single person, but it ends in death. Here's the idea. We are all self-deluded. We all think we know, and we don't. It's why God has to rewrite our stories. You realize that, right? He's rewriting us. We think, but no, this is the truth. We're deluded. That's a general verse about a lot of things, but I'm going to use it specifically this way. Christians, you think you have to earn your way back to God, and that's what got rewritten in Molly, and it's what needs to get rewritten in you. You do not have to earn your way back to God, and you can't earn your way back to God. It's absolutely not possible, and you will be frustrated, and you will walk the way of the Pharisee, judging other people, being cruel toward them, self-righteously being religious if you go that path. That way leads to death. Next verse, Isaiah 64, 6. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, even our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So even if we've had a bad section of our life, and then we turn around, we try to do the right thing. According to that, we can't even do the right thing well. It's just like filthy rags at the end of the day. Why? Because our self-reliance is still there and our bad motivations are still there and you've still got that tone in your voice when you do that thing that you thought was a good thing. And we always muck it up and we add our stink to everything that we do. Do we not? Not trying to bash us today. I'm just saying, this is the reality. We would like to come to God and say, hey, you know those justice scales in heaven? I want to do enough good things to counterbalance the bad that I've done. And maybe then St. Peter will let me through the pearly gates. You'll never do it. You can never do enough good. That's what that verse is saying. So then go on to James 2, verse 10. You're really going to love this one. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Whoo! You're welcome. I remember the very first time I read that verse, I just absolutely trembled at it. It, it. Let me ask it to you this way. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know what? I do a couple of bad things, but I do a whole lot of good things. And when I compare myself to other people, I don't do nearly as many bad things as those people do. See, that's the path of self-righteous. Anybody do that or is that just me today? James comes and says, man, even if you break one, even if you're just struggling in one area of rebellion against God, you're still in rebellion against God. If you've invited self-reliance into your life, selfishness into your life, in just one area, it's in there. It's like a cancer. It's just there. You're broken and there's no hope aside from Jesus. So let's look at Titus 3, 4, and this is where it all turns around. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, Amen. he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done. See, none of our righteousness can counterbalance. You see it again. But because of his what? His mercy. His mercy, the thing that you didn't deserve is exactly what he gave you. If you had tried to earn it, if you had been successful, it wouldn't be mercy. It would be the thing that you earned. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. So this is what it's saying, just like we did with communion today, is there was a moment in human history where Jesus came. And he looked at your entire record of sin. How many pages are in that record for you? Come on. How many cases of paper for me? How many truckloads do I have that are assigned to me? And Jesus took all of that and he died and he took on the punishment for everything that I had done and he marked paid at the end. That's what the cross is. A lot of people come, come to Christianity and they're like, what's this cross all about? Why did Jesus even have to die? What was this all about? It's, it's all about paying for our sin so that we don't have to. You know cancel culture? I'm not going to come and bash cancel culture today. I'm just going to. <laughs> why? 
I just want to draw one thing out that I think is confusing about it. In cancel culture, somebody goes and they do a wrong thing. And then the idea is that we all judge them for it. We all cancel them for it. We all make them pay for it. And even when the person, you see this in our culture, even when the person tries to make amends, tries to apologize, tries to do the things, because the whole way we've set this thing up is so broken, you kind of never know when they've done enough. You never know when the bill is paid, when the thing is settled, when they can come back. It's structured wrong for the whole thing. Here's part of the amazing kindness of God is he comes into your entire life of sin, and he says, if anybody can settle it, it's the God of the entire universe who made you. It's the source of all true justice, of all love. He is our heavenly parent. He, He comes in and he says, I'm the one person that if you settle it with me, it's settled. If you settle it with me, it's done Well, what about what everybody else says? Doesn't matter what they say. You can't wait around for what they say. It's settled right here, once for all. And so when Jesus dies for your sins and says, you're forgiven, period, there's a real period there. Do you see what God does for us? Jesus comes and dies for your sins and says, and I say, it's settled. New birth, washed away your sins, cleaned up, they're gone. Molly said, he loved me just the way I was. Do you see it? Do you see the grace in those words? Uh, Kung Fu Panda. (laughs) Even Rocky. There's always a training montage in the center of the show, isn't there? So here's the way the story of the hero goes, is the hero comes against the big bad guy, and they lose. They can't do it. And so then they go into the training montage, the hero montage. And like, and you don't know how long they're training, right? Like they go out into the woods with the ninja master. And they're really weak and really terrible. And after all kinds of work, and again, you don't know if it was six weeks or six years, but they get strong. They get strong and they work at it and they earn it. And after they get strong and after the music's done and after the hero montage is done, they finally face the big bad guy and they win. And it's a great story every single time. Go to Molly's story. Where was her hero montage at? It's not there. It's not there. She was broken. Jesus came in, reached out to her, said, now you're saved. She didn't go into the penalty box. She didn't go into purgatory. She didn't sit in the back row of the church and say, "Just you just be on ice for a while. You think about what you've done. There's none of that. Do you see what grace actually is? See, there's no hero montage. There's no training montage because you're not the one who's doing anything. And because of that, you're also not the hero. That's why there's no montage. Because you misunderstood. You thought you were the hero of this story, and you're not. You're the runaway. You're the one that's got to be rescued. That's actually the story that you're in. It's a rescue story. Amen? Amen. The son of God's the hero. Gosh. And the prodigal son. Doesn't the prodigal son start to make more sense after you hear Molly's story? What are we? We're just the ones who left home. We left home and we did all the bad things and we decided to come back. And and between deciding to come back and get into the front porch, not much happened, did it? We didn't do anything. We just came back home. The father did it all. Why? You got to ask, why did the father do it all? Because that's the kind of love he actually has for you. Do you realize that? Like like everything part of us that, that wants to earn something is because we've got an opinion about who the father is and what he wants from us. No, 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 no. He's just a parent, and love just flows out of his heart towards you. And that's it. And it just, it's so hard for us to understand. There's this verse in Isaiah. It says, can a mother forget the baby that she's nursing and have no compassion on the child that she has born? 
Though she might forget, even though it's possible for a mom to forget her baby, God says, I'll not forget you ever. And what's he saying there? He's saying the only way for you to even understand the love that I have for people is like a parent just has love. They just have love for your child. You parents know what I'm talking about. That's how God loves you. And so when the son comes up the road and the prodigal son, by the way, it's a bad title. It's actually the loving father is the story. Because he's the hero. The son just comes up and the father just loves. And he doesn't just accept and say, go into the penalty box. He says, no, throw a party for this guy. He just loves. All right, I got to tell you this. If you're a church kid, and I mean like if you're a real kid here today, and you're growing up presently in the church, there may come a time, I'm just going to warn you, there may come a day where you walk away from the church. There come, may come a day where spiritually you kind of crash, where you get mad, you get disillusioned. All those things that your parents are working really hard get, trying to get you not to do, you're going to do some of them. And when you go and you crash on the rocks, what are you going to do then? Just come back home. Amen. Just come back home. It's that simple. Please remember my words. When it comes to that day, just come back home. Don't stay back. Don't think you got to earn. Just come back home. That's it. Amen? Let's go to Will's testimony. Will's testimony. Um, you're going to hear a lot of the same ideas in Will's, but also different. Um, lean into this one. Um, he's got a lot to share with us. Let's go ahead and put, play Will's. My life uh, was like before Christ. I grew up in a, a big family in San Diego, and uh, my life was great. I had a huge family. My parents loved me, took care of me. Although when I was little, my parents got divorced. And for the longest time, they were split up for a while. And I have an older brother and older sister. And we were caught in the middle of that. But regardless, our parents loved us. They took care of us. They put food on the table. They raised us to be uh, good kids and grow up to be good adults. But I grew up in the church, and I remember growing up that I, hadn't, I didn't want anything to do with it. I'd fallen asleep in church, trying to get out of going. Um, and then eventually, my immediate family just fell off. We stopped going to church. It was talked about. We said we believed in Christ, but I really didn't. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anything about it, and I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but growing up, Although I had a great family, I, I struggled with a lot of insecurities, um, no confidence. I always felt that I had this void or this something missing, and it was, it was rough, it was tough, and it was, it was really hard growing up. And so I filled that with a lot of fake confidence, and I was able to talk my way through anything. Um, that. I got into things as a high schooler that I shouldn't have got into. I wasted a lot of time. Um, and I, just normal high schooler things, but a lot of things that I knew that I deep down I didn't want to do, but I was doing them too, just trying to win approval from everyone. And when I was 18, I joined the Army. Uh, when I joined the Army, it was like high school all over again. And except that no one knew me, so I could be anyone that I wanted to be. And so I, I created an image that I wanted to be, and it still did not fill that void and the emptiness that I had. And I got into normal, I don't want to say normal, but typical soldier things, young soldier does, drinking, partying, um, just being young. And I always knew that as much as I did it, that I hated it. It drove me nuts. And I just knew that even though I was able to choose who I wanted to be, that it, the emptiness wasn't going away. My brother was diagnosed with uh, cancer right before I joined the Army. And he had a, a life-changing experience. And eventually he found Christ. And I would say he's probably the first one in my immediate family to find Christ. 
Um, he tried to get me to come to faith. And so that drove that relationship away. And eventually in the army, I got a little bit of taste of success, uh, promoted and I liked it. And so I created an identity that if I could be the best soldier or best person anywhere I went, that I could fill this emptiness that I had. So everywhere I went, I strive to be the best. I strive to outwork everyone. I strive to compete and do better than everyone. And that was the identity that I created. And I thought it was gonna fix it. And it didn't. Um, and I got to a point that I reached all my goals. I accomplished a lot. I, I married a, my beautiful wife. Um, and in 2020, I, got, I reached my biggest accolade. I won drill sergeant in NCO of the year here on Fort Sill. Uh, I competed at the big army level. Uh, I had every promotion you can think of my way. I was selected to be an officer. Um, and I had everything I wanted at my disposal. My, my career could have gone either way. And, but what deep down, no one knew that I was struggling with an identity issue. And uh, I didn't know how to fulfill it. Because at the very top of my career, I thought it was gonna go away and it didn't. And so it led to, on August 22nd, I made a horrible decision and I got a DUI. And it's probably the worst decision that I've ever made because I put so many people's lives at risk. And it was selfish. And it just, I still uh, struggle with it today, but I know that I'm forgiven. Um, and that is something that led me to finding Christ. Um, on August 28th, I was driving to work and it was my first day back to work after the incident. And I was driving to work and I was listening to the song Starting Over by Chris Stapleton. And when I heard the word starting over, I immediately started bawling my eyes out. And I couldn't control it. I was just bawling my eyes out. And it felt that everything around me had stopped. Uh, cars, people were gone. It just was me by myself. And all I could hear were the words, it's okay, I have you, follow me, over and over and over. And it's all I could hear. And at that moment, I knew that Christ was calling. So I knew I had to give my life to Christ, and I did. And I still, as you can tell, feel that moment. And it's, it's not explainable. So on August 28th of 2020, I showed up at Grace Church and I was scared because of knowing how many times I'd pushed Christ away. And growing up, you know, like, I always had this image of oh, people with tattoos and people like this, and you have this Christian image, and if you don't feel it, like, I was scared, I was nervous, you know, and I walked into the foyer and I was about to turn around. And I was like, I can't do this. And at the time, uh, previous pastor, Tanner, just came up to me and said, hey man, those are awesome tattoos. And that was it, that's all he said. And he walked away. And for some reason, that was the, the push to just go in the door. And since then, my, my life has been changed. My life has looked differently now that I have Christ in my life because to start off, I no longer have an identity issue. Um, I know that my identity is not in worldly things, it's in Christ. And I would love to say that being saved by Christ, that my life is rainbows and everything is perfect, but that's it's not the case. Uh, I still struggle. I still have my uh, brokenness. Um, But one thing that I have learned is, is it, it is not about the to-do list or it is not about the things that you think you have to do to earn a standing with God. It's, it's a, solely about the relationship you have with Him. 
And until you can root yourself in that relationship, uh, it will only start to grow. It just, it just grows. And another thing I learned since my life with Christ is I had to start, I had to stop trying to start where I thought I needed to be and just needed to start where I was at and God would handle the rest. And when I learned that, uh, God has taken my life to so many different levels. He's blessed me with so much. Uh, everything, everything that was taken away from me in my career because of my, my mishap and my poor decision has been restored. Uh, I was on the verge of getting kicked out of the army. I didn't get kicked out. Um, my, all my promotions were taken away. Um, and by the grace of God, everything's being restored. And I'm just so blessed that he found me when he did. Wasn't that good? Yeah. So good. I feel so blessed that these folks shared their stories with us. Let's look at Will's story for a second. He does what a lot of us, I think, do. Uh, he wants fulfillment. He wants fulfillment. He wants identity. And so he sets out across his life to achieve, to achieve, to be ambitious. Anybody in the room feel this? I'm going to make my mark. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill this hole that's here with this stuff. Houses and boats and careers and degrees and family and all the stuff. And if I can fill it, I'll be good. And it doesn't work. How many of you have walked that road? No, it doesn't work. And he found that it doesn't work. And even when it comes to God, the reason this is so powerful for us is even when it comes to God, we can start to do the same thing. I'm the one who will seek God. I'm the one who will fix this. And he realizes he can't. Who seeks will? God does. Who's the seeker in the relationship? God is. Again, he's the hero. Um, in that car with that country song playing, God said to Will, it's okay, I have you, follow me. What an amazing salvation. It's like God busted into his life and just rescued this guy. And no hero montage, by the way. Matthew 18, verse 12. This is Jesus' words. He says, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over that sheep more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. And in the same way, it is not my heavenly father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. God is a seeking God. God is coming after you. Same way he came after Will. You think you're the one who has to seek just like you think you're the one who had to do everything else. Stop all your striving. There's a guy named Francis Thomas in the year 1890. He was an opium addict on the streets of London, England. And he was a poet. Life was a mess. And he wrote this multi-page poem right before he died, actually. And it's all about the fact, it's called the hound of heaven. It's all about the fact that he kept trying to do anything else in his life except for God. He kept trying to get fulfillment in all these other ways. And he couldn't. And it all came up empty. Everything was desert. Everything was dry. And God just kept coming after him. God wouldn't leave him alone. God was relentless. He was like a hound of heaven. God's been coming after you. See, Christianity is one of these faiths. If we really get saved, if we really understand, we become worshipers because he's so good. Do you realize how good he is today? He can speak through a country song 
Do you realize how good he is today? He seeks us when we're not seeking him. Do you realize how good he is today? When we haven't earned it and there's been no hero montage, we've done nothing at all to even be noticed by God. He notices us. We haven't been lovable and yet he loves us because love just pours out of him. It's not about us, it's about him. Amen? I want you to stand right now. And this is a super chill, non-pressure moment, but we're gonna pray and I'm gonna give you a chance to pray. And the reason I'm gonna give you a chance to pray is because some of you, maybe just a few of you in this room, you're at this spot where you're like, I'm ready to come back home. It's all been broken. And I'm ready to come back home. I've been, maybe I've been trying and I'm gonna be done with trying. So I just wanna give you a chance to pray that. I'm not gonna make you come forward. I'm not gonna make any of that happen. We're just gonna pray this prayer together. And if this is your moment, if this is where you are with Jesus, I want you to pray these in your heart to him. Let's pray. And it's just gonna be a phrase at a time so we can all say it out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for coming after me. I didn't seek you. You sought after me. I didn't fix this. You fixed me. I didn't clean myself up. You cleaned me. You forgave me. You died for me. Jesus, we love you. Would you give me a new start? Welcome me home. I want to walk with you. I want to love you for all eternity. Thank you, Lord. Amen.